somebody's wife, if you're listening, this one's for you. I'm Lisa Flux. I'm Ben McKenzie. Welcome to Pratt Chat, the monthly Terry Pratchett book club podcast. Each month we discuss one of Terry Pratchett's books with a special guest. This month we decided for our 50th episode to go the whole og, so we are doing Nanny Og's cookbook. <laughs> and we are delighted to have as our returning guest, comedian and author, and our very first guest on this podcast... Cal Wilson. Welcome back, Cal. Oh, thanks for having me. It only seems like a couple of weeks since we last spoke. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, and But would you believe it's four years since you were last on this oh, podcast? Man. I would not believe that. I would not believe that. I know. I feel it's so weird because we had you on the first episode and we had such a good time and it turned out the first Discworld book you ever read was the one we were doing two episodes later. So you just came back almost immediately. And then we had so much fun then we decided we couldn't possibly have that much fun again for four years. So <laughs> we, we paced ourselves. But yeah, what a delight. How have you been? I mean, obviously the world has been... Great. Uh, I recently in an email used Terry's words and said the world has contracted an embuggerance of its own that's affecting all of us. <laughs> But what's what's been going on for you since we saw you last? Well, it's that it's that weird thing of it's been four years since we spoke, but two of those years don't count. Mm, so, true. I was saying to someone last night, it feels like if this was like a tape measure, we've just cut the two years out in the middle and joined it together. So it feels like those two years have not happened to me. <laughs> like I just feel like you know, like I've dozed off and I've woken up and I've oh, I've somehow got two years older and my son is taller, but everything else <laughs> seems the same. You just Rip Van Winkled it. Yeah, I feel like I've just been at home watching reality TV for two years. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about and right. And making fabulous hats, though. You've been oh, doing that. Oh, that's true. Yes, I have been. I have got back into the glue gunning, and I have made a lot of lockdown headdresses. And I've just got onto TikTok, which I don't. I still don't know what TikTok is, but I'm on it. And I'm just posting a lot of cat videos. I'm I'm treating my cats uh, like they're baristas when they sit on the coffee machine, and so I'm just. <laughs> I'm just doing, just doing cat videos. This might be the push I need to actually get TikTok because I was on the fence, but cats as baristas, I think you've sold me. Well, you know, barista cats, what a great title. Yeah. I'm running it down. <laughs> oh, no. I'm now trying to imagine what the setup for the barista cats payoff oh, punchline could musical. be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, basically, it's just me trying to get a coffee off them and they have terrible customer service and they never give me a coffee. <laughs> so that's the, that's the whole thing. Well, well, I'm I'm more thinking, you, you know, the aristocrats joke, right? Now I'm thinking, oh, what is the yeah. barista cats punchline? I guess it's what you're doing. It's like, oh, and then the coffee was terrible, and then they they made fun of my order, uh, and then one of them spent the whole time on the phone not look paying attention. And- yeah, you've, it's like you've been watching my TikTok. That's exactly yeah. what's <laughs> what's been going on. I mean, they've branched out. They've opened a cafe on the microwave as well. So. Um, <laughs> They have cafe microwave now. It's got candlelight, uh, which is an LED candle because I've met them before and I know that a real candle would be just fatal. Mm. I mean, they should have gone a bit fancier and gone with cafe microwave, but... True, mm. true. Mm. They're not very sophisticated. Mm. No. It's pirate and barnacle, isn't yes, it? Yes, that's real right. Cats. Such good cat names. Well, everyone's oh. pointed out, my friends on TikTok, because now I'm friends with people on TikTok, uh, they've pointed mm. out that Barnacle acts like a barnacle because he just wants to cuddle all the time and Pirate swipes and bites, so he is like a pirate. So oh, the, no. is it nominative determinism? Is that the thing where you fulfill your name? Yeah, I think so. that's the thing. So maybe they understand more than we think. Mm. They're doing it deliberately. My cat's name is Chaos. And, um... and what was the first thing he did when he moved into the new house? He escaped and went missing for five days. Oh, God. Is he back? Yeah, yeah, we got him back. He probably had a whole uh, movie's worth of adventures in that time. Like, there's a whole <laughs> arc there. There is. Meanwhile, my cats are called um, Asimov and Huxley, so all they do is release um, prestige television series based off their <laughs> their books. <laughs> and have ideas that are really ahead of their time that you're only going to appreciate, like, 50 years from now. <laughs> yeah, that's what uh, all the yelling is. I understand now. <laughs> 
They really are having a renaissance, yeah. though, both of them, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, um, they should probably start paying rent. <laughs> yeah, pull your, pull your weight, guys. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, all those checks, they're mm-hmm. coming in, it's rolling in. Well, speaking of books, I don't think there's going to be a prestige series based on Nanny Og's cookbook. But, but I would watch could it. Be, well, I, well now, that, now you've said this, it's put into my head the idea of the great discish bake-off or something, you know, like with oh. just Discworld characters. Or what competing. about kind of like a Bridgerton-style one where it's a bit saucy, but it's all just elderly people? <laughs> Ooh. I would like, now, Nanny Og would be bang up for that. She'd be oh, right in totally. there. Totally. Okay. All right. I'm sold. I'm sold. Uh, but before we adapt it and, and make a billion dollars out of this uh, idea, we probably should discuss <laughs> the book, uh, which is, of course, Daddy Og's cookbook. Uh, so let's, let's read the blurb. They say that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach, which just goes to show they're as confused about anatomy as they generally are about everything else, unless they're talking about instructions on how to stab him, in which case a better way is up and under the ribcage. Anyway, we do not live in a perfect world and it is foresighted and useful for a young woman to become proficient in those arts which will keep a weak-willed man from straying. Learning to cook is also useful. Nanny Og, one of Discworld's most famous witches, is passing on some of her huge collection of tasty and, above all, interesting recipes, since everyone else is doing it. But in addition to the delights of the strawberry wobbler and Nobby's mum's distressed pudding, Mrs Og imparts her thoughts on life death, etiquette, if you go to other people's funerals, they'll be sure to come to yours, courtship, (laughs) children and weddings, all in a refined style that should not offend the most delicate of sensibilities. Well, not much. Most of the recipes have been tried out on people who are still alive. Also, there's a little footnote on mine uh, which says, Mrs. Og gratefully acknowledges the assistance in this literary argosy of Mr. Terry Pratchett, Mr. Stephen Briggs, uh, Mademoiselle Tina Hannan and Master Paul Kidby, who have all been roped into the disc world as editors and illustrators. I think that sets the scene pretty well. I mean, it does what it says on the tin, this book, mostly. It really does. I was surprised there was as much sort of framing narrative mm. at the start as there was. Because yeah. you kind of you open it up and the first thing that happens, you get this sort of series of memos between the publishers. And these are characters who appear in Masquerade when uh, Nanny's first cookbook, <laughs> The Joy of Snacks, <laughs> is published and then subsequently banned for its uh, extreme effects on people. Especially um, that guy's wife who giggled quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I feel sorry for her. She's the one that I think about the most mm. of like a like brief foray into happiness in her marriage and then <laughs> no more nanny og books to read. What What's she to do? <laughs> She's having a great time. Yeah. <laughs> but that was I found this fun because there's no real plot in this, but there are all these little extra little bits of here's what's happening in the world of the disc and in particular this poor beleaguered publishing company. I mean, I say that in Masquerade, they're clearly fleecing Nanny out of tons of money because they printed her book and it's selling like hotcakes, but they're pretending it hasn't. It's very, very old school Hollywood accounting, <laughs> um, which uh, Granny demolishes. But yeah, we find out some of their other books, including a travel book for Ank Morpork, which is dangerous because of how inaccurate it is. <laughs> Then there's a what's well, supposedly an art book, but is clearly just a bunch of uh, nude pictures. It's an art book, but it's been banned and is now being sold on the black market. I just, I mean, look, I've, I'm old enough. I have flashbacks to to high school before the internet days, when if you found an even slightly racy picture, it would do the rounds. We had an Encyclopedia Britannica. We had a set at home. We were fancy, and it had like in the body section, it had like these um sort of cellophane pages with the layers of the body. So you could kind of like turn the pages over and go further and further into the intestines of a human. But I remember being like aghast at being able to look at a penis and testicles, like even in a medical encyclopedia sense of just being like, oh, fruit. <laughs> yeah. We had um that cartoon book, Where Do You Come From? And it was created like the like porn kind of thing. Everyone's like, oh, it's like a big deal. But it was literally for children to learn about where they come from. Yeah. We've got the yeah. we've got the one I've still got it. Uh, it's called uh, How Babies Are Made, and it's kind of like sexy origami. So it's like these kind of cu- um, <laughs> paper cutouts of animals, and it's like this very happy rooster and chicken and a smiling pair of spaniels who are sort of at it. And then there's mum and dad, but you don't see them below the shoulders; they're in bed together, kind of thing. But it's very um, so hilariously. It's like the least sexual kind of way to talk about <laughs> sex, kind of, but wow. still scandalous at the time. <laughs> Mm. I also find mm. it very funny that um, previously, like, Ken dolls, um, they just had, like, nothing there. Like, it was just, like, a smoothness. But, like, later on, at some point, someone clearly decided that that's a bit weird. So we got to, like, make 
a white streak around them to make it look like they're wearing underpants, but like permanent underpants. <laughs> the mound, the yeah. non-specific mound. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, so weird. Mm. It reminds me of uh, you know what's that the Danger Kevin Five? Smith film Dogma, where Alan Rickman's playing an angel, and to prove that he's an angel to the humans, uh, he like drops his pants, and he's just got nothing there. He's like a Ken doll. Wow. <laughs> like, I have, now I'm going to go and watch that film. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So passing around racy pictures has changed quite a lot as we're adults. It's like, oh, I want to see this movie there where Alan Rickman has nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can't see anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's too late. I've seen nothing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it was a really fun intro to the book. And then there's that one note that's just a whole list of different books that Nanny Hogg has cribbed from, like where they've realized yes. she's just copied stuff out of these other books and no one seems that fussed by it. <laughs> Yes, I love that is, kind of cheerful plagiarism. Mm. Yeah. Which is like, like what a cunning, topical cunning old woman. at the moment, considering that there's been like a big furor in the last month or two about a cookbook being plagiarized. Oh, yeah, that's right. I don't know this story. Tell me the story. Oh, there's apparently like a big chef in England, I think, who released her first like celebrity cookbook about, I think it was like Singaporean cuisine. And it's got like a sort of memoir element through it, like talking about like seeing her family cook in the kitchens and things. But it turns out like another chef who published a similar book about five years earlier has come out and said that this is actually my book that has been repurposed and there's like full sentences taken from it and it's been pulled from shelves and everything. So that's sort of all wow. in the last month. It's been like a whole thing that's blown up. So when I read that bit mm. about her taking bits from other books in the library, I was like, oh, like they're treating this like it's fun and it's totally fine. It's not a problem in the publishing industry when zeitgeisty Lee, zeitgeisty Lee, it's like the mm. extreme opposite. Mm. Well, it's pretty common, like, back in the... I mean, if we're thinking about the historical era that matches where the disc world is at, people did it all the time. Like, there weren't, like, sophisticated copyright laws and ways to stop people. But I know? guess it's not the recipes. It was more like the memoir elements that... Yes, yeah, stealing yeah. someone's family. Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's so creepy. And it, apparently it wasn't just from one book either. Oof. Like, it was mostly from one book, but then there's bits from other books. It's fairly lazily paraphrased. Like, it's all the same things with slightly different wording. It's... It's pretty damning. And wow. Like when, when I grew up as an elderly man in Moscow. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, I mean, the worst part is, right, is that she's, she's taken these things, you know, culturally it was like this important thing where like your grandmother would hand down these recipes to wow. you and it was a, the food was a big part of the sort of home life. And so while she might have had similar experiences, like sort of ripping off these specific, we should probably cover ourselves and say, I don't think anything's been proven, but it seems pretty clear. And the publishers certainly have decided that it's not worth it. And they've How, how insecure do you have to be about your own ability and your own story to take someone else's? Yeah. Like that's like yeah. when it's a memoir. I had a friend, uh, she went to a new hairdresser when she moved to Auckland. She went to this new hairdresser the first time. She kind of told him her story, you know, they're chatting away, um, you know, did theatre sports at high school and then taught in private university and did a master's degree and stuff. And then she went back to him six weeks later and he told her her story as if it was his story. No. What? Yeah. So she was like, I was sitting there and he was going, oh, I did theatre sports at school and then I taught in private university and I was doing a master's. And and I was like, what did you do? And she's like, I just didn't do anything. I was like too scared. <laughs> like he's holding the scissors. <laughs> it's just extremely funny because like pretending that you've done – someone else's improv as a story that you've taken from them. It's like oh. the extreme opposite of that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I cannot improv at all. I've just <laughs> stolen your script. That's weird. Mm. Deeply weird. I don't know how I'd handle that. I don't know what I would do. Maybe you just tell them the story again. Actually, like, interestingly, like, I've also done this. And then you just tell each other that story back and forth until one of you into dies. It warps. It warps into some fantastical thing. Or you sit there and go, oh, that's really interesting because I trained as a hairdresser. Um, I went to TAFE and <laughs> <laughs> I ended that's up cutting great. a woman's hair and I told her her own story. <laughs> and presumably they're looking into a mirror at this point as well. Yeah. Like, mm. <laughs> oh, it's very meta. I don't know if I can handle that. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, the great intro to the book. I really enjoyed that. And then we get into the first section, which is the longest section of the book, the cookbook itself with all the recipes, which has this great intro, uh, including recipes, items of antiquarian law, improving observations of life, good advice for young people on the threshold of the adventure that is marriage. <laughs> Such a good old fashioned phrase. Uh, notes on etiquette and many other helpful observations that will not offend the most delicate sensibilities before we get into the book. I, yeah, it's just I think it's very well framed. I like it when a lot of effort goes in to recreating the thing. 
Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's not just a, oh, we'll just a slam a couple of recipes together. It's like, oh, we're going to use the form and relate it back to all of the, you know, like like the books that I have in my bookshelf of like A Woman's World from 1950 that has all the things about improving yourself for marriage and how to undress in front of your husband and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like I love that that they're going to the trouble of making it feel authentic. But in yeah. such a nanny og way. And yes. it's just and there's so much snark about husbands and marriage and <laughs> yeah. throughout, which I love. <laughs> but um yeah, like that thing about when like when a husband says he cooks, I, she says like I suspect that means he cooks one thing twice a year and then leaves the dishes in the sink to soak. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that was that. That was the sentence that got me as well. The to soak in quotation marks. <laughs> oh, horrendous! It's so, oh, but it's how are these things still true? This is what I want to know. I mean, this book is uh, 1999. This was published, so this is this is 20 years old. Oh, they'll probably be um, true forever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, we're working on it. We're working on it. <laughs> I also love I love the earthy sensibility of Nanny Og. Like she's such a strong character and you recognise her absolutely from her other appearances. Like it's not a sprinkling of Nanny Og, like it's baked through and through. And yeah. her kind of you know, I just love the way she talks about her many husbands and that kind of oh, I don't know why anyone's bothered by this. It's just natural kind of like I love I love that, like that immovable force. Mm. Immovable force? You know, the the unstoppable yeah. force that she is that mm. You can't take the og out of Nanny Og. She's unflappable. Yeah. And I love that she's here by herself, so to speak. Like, this is her time to shine. Yes. Um, I mean, she she gets some really good time in some of the novels, like particularly Carpe Jugnum, where Granny's kind of out of the action for quite a while and Nanny's, like, at the forefront. But this is so great. I love this. And, she, I mean, she gets real bolshy as well. Like, there's, uh, <laughs> there's that bit uh, in her little introduction where she's talking about when etiquette is important, like in when you're talking to nobility. <laughs> and it's like sometimes you've got to defer and use all the titles and other times you're like, get out of the way, you horrible, oppressive lout. Like, you know, it's, it's yeah, I love that side of her that you don't get to see as much in the books. And I also like the translation that they had, like the editor's note that they said that they had to do a little bit of translating to make it palatable and also like the idea that her like scrolled down recipes have like a bit of this and some of that, but like a bit of flour is probably more than some of salt and like just the, yeah. and it's, it's so logical, but also like, yeah, it's just, cause it, it does feel like the kind of recipes you do get from family or that you sort of hmm. develop yourselves, like that it's hard to pin down. So I think it makes the recipes themselves feel like a little bit more extraordinary for lack of a better word, because it does feel like they've been taken from, the real world and it's nailed down on the page. Which mm. cool. And the, the other thing I like too is that um, the pages look like cookbook pages. You know, like when I'm, when I'm reading it, I'm like, oh, God, have I got this wet? And it's like, oh, no, it's just the it's the weathering <laughs> that they've put in the book to make it look like a recipe book that you've used a hundred times and got water on or flour or whatever. Like it just those little touches. Yeah. I see. I miss yeah, out on that because I have the um, e-book version. So it's uh, beautifully oh, pristine this- and clear. I can fix this for you. I have a spare copy. Can't even be polite and be like, no, because I'm like, I want it. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's, no, please don't be polite. Just accept this gift. I liked the editor's note thing also because I think they do a really seamless job of positioning themselves both as the Discworld fictional editors who are fixing up Nanny's spelling and grammar or putting in the spelling and grammar, <laughs> as they put it, uh, in order to make it more readable, but while preserving the essential nanny ogness of it, and also being the real world editors who are translating this supposed Discworld recipes into what we can make here on our planet, where we don't have access to all the same fruits and vegetables and spices. Yep, and, and, and I, little notes of like, no, really, don't use arsenic. Like, the- yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was great. It's just such a lot of fun. And I think the Discworld works so well for this. Like you see these books come out for other things. Like there's a Game of Thrones cookbook. There's a a Star Trek cookbook. There's a Doctor Who cookbook uh, from back in the 80s. And some of them work much better than others. Like a Game of Thrones one, you can kind of imagine the kind of stuff that's in that. Mead. it's not probably that sophisticated. Mead and a hunk of mutton. (laughs) That's it. It's just two pages, really. Um, (laughs) Yeah. But but they it would be difficult, I think, to write that from an in-world perspective because they would never publish a cookbook in the world of, of no, Game of Thrones. No. Except for that that like um boy who likes baking bread. He, I can see him making a bread cookbook for himself. The one that Arya like oh, goes yeah. on the travels with. Hot pie. Oh yeah. Yeah, that guy. Yeah. All yeah. I can remember from the books, um, is just how much he talked about boiled leather. So maybe there'd be like recipes for boiled leather. 
like <laughs> different lengths of boiling and like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other book, I think. That would probably get banned in Ankh Morpork, I think. <laughs> I do really enjoy that it gives insight into characters as well because, like, because across Discworld you get to know the characters so well. You can mm. kind of be like, oh, yeah, what would this one eat? Or, like, what's, like, the – what do you think yeah. this person would contribute? And it does really line up with what's in there, especially yes, veterinary. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Yes, I, I noticed that as well. That was a, that's such a great one for him. But also, like, that the librarian's recipe is a banana. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there's quite a bit of setup to that before you get to the banana. And that's exactly how you do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was pleasantly surprised by that because I didn't know that anybody else's recipes would be in it. I love that. Rid that Cully so does absolutely seem like the kind of guy who would make his own like family brand intense sauce. Like he does seem like he'd just have bottles of it on the shelf behind him in his like fancy office so that when he's eating like a lunch at his desk as well, he'd just be able to like jot some in there. Yeah, and yeah. and also maybe it would be gifts for people and people would be like, We can't use this, it it burned a hole in the bottle. Like it would <laughs> <Yeah>. be <laughs> <laughs> I, I worked in Austria in a skiing village for six months when I was in my early 20s and our boss made schnapps, but it was basically nail polish remover. Like, so oh, like I remember going to the family orchard and picking the apples and it was, man, you could have just stripped the varnish off the bar with it. It was so intense, but it was a family tradition. Yeah. Wow. And like you couldn't say no to like a red colour offered gift and he would insist on watching you try it. Yes. <laughs> Did you try the schnapps? Explode. Uh, yeah, it was but only a very tiny amount. <laughs> Are wise. you still drunk very now? Wise. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have half a tongue. I mean, it was really. <laughs> oh, lordy. Yeah, wow. Well, there's so much room given to all of that stuff, putting that characterful stuff in there. Like the beautiful like philosophy of cookery bit from Danny Og. Well, there's all these different ways of cooking and it's different in the country and this is why farmers grow enormous vegetables it's not for the prestige it's because you need to feed people and yeah and it's like that the thing that terry pratchett does where he, he'll say something that's kind of funny and then you go oh geez that's really true mm. like like yeah. it's that just those insights that he has into humanity and the way we do things yeah just that I, i'd like that struck me as well that line of like oh oh that's a really good point yeah i need to feed a lot of people like had never thought yeah. about it before for the show notes, we definitely should put in that Twitter account of the charming man in England who grows vegetables and his whole account is him just showing off like what vegetable he's oh. picked this day. It is the oh. most wholesome, lovely thing in the yep. world. So, yeah, it just sparks a lot of joy for me, a lot of joy over the last year. So I will send that link your way. Absolutely. That is the, I've, I've seen that once or twice. It is a delight. Yeah. And then we get into the recipes themselves. And there's quite a lot of them. Like when I, I sort of made a list for purposes that we will discuss at the end of this episode. I don't want to spoil it now. But there's like 50 recipes in here. 51 or 52, actually, if we include all the ones that are jokes, of which there are a few <laughs> that you can't really cook. You cast uh, a few of jokes of... that I don't think are jokes, but... <laughs> Okay, all right. <laughs> Controversy. Well, we'll, we'll, mm. we'll get to that then, I think. That sounds uh, an interesting discussion. But, yeah, and, and she does say that she's sort of tried to organise them as sort of starters and then mains and then desserts. Um, but starters, sheep's eyes. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's a conversation starter, if nothing else. <laughs> um, uh, but it's great. And everyone is a reference to something else. This is a real fan's book, you know, like most of the novels very much stand alone and any references to other stuff mm. from the disc world are kind of explained enough in context that you don't need to have read those other books. Because this is just full of, uh, and again, you don't need to have read any of those things, but there's just such a lot of stuff that is in here that's like, yeah. And there's even footnotes that say, see this book for more about this bit. And it's just a delight. Things like, and I, because I haven't read a Discworld book for a wee while. I can't, mm. It was funny, like, reading this book and going, oh, there's no more waiting for the next one to come out. Like, yeah. like that, like, I had a moment of real sadness of going, because I think my son is just about old enough to start reading them and I can't wait to introduce them to him, of going, oh, he'll never get the thing of going, oh, it's been a few months now, there's going to be another Terry yeah. Pratchett kind of thing. Um, but what I loved, like, the the recipe that I loved the most was Bloody Stupid Johnson's Individual Fruit Pie. <laughs> but the yes. thing that I loved about it, I can't remember if this is mentioned in the book where you first meet Bloody Stupid Johnson, but the fact that his name is actually Bergholt Stutley Johnson or Bloody Stupid Johnson 
as if it's been translated from one language into another, you know, like, or like the, <laughs> like the detail of, of going, oh, that's where it comes from kind of thing. But also flicking through the book before I sat down and read the whole thing and looking for a recipe that I was going to cook, I just flicked onto the second page of the recipe where it doesn't have what the name of the recipe is. And I was looking at the ingredients. I was like, what am I going to cook? And I was like, 30,000 pounds of plain <laughs> flour. <laughs> And then, yeah. and then look back and went, oh, it's bloody stupid Johnson. That makes absolute sense. But it also did remind me. So this recipe is 30,000 pounds of plain flour, 30,000 teaspoons of salt, 15,000 pounds of butter, margarine, et cetera, et cetera, 30 tons of cooking apples. I did some gigs on cruise ships. Like We used to do comedy cruises in, in the days when that was a healthy thing to do. Um, so I was on a cruise and our producer had the tomato soup in the restaurant and she was like, oh, I hate tomato soup, but I really love this tomato soup. And so she asked one of the waiting staff if they could get her the recipe of the tomato soup. She had it every day on the cruise. Uh -huh. And they got it from the chef. And it was literally like 150,000 litres of water, like 6,000 <laughs> 6, tins of canned tomato. Like it was just so wow. – she's like, I don't, I don't even know how to divide this to make a serving for six people. Yeah. <laughs> See now, this is this is one though. This this is one that I class as a joke, Liz. Do you class this one as a joke, or do you want to actually try and make this pie? No, I'm like, I, I, it's a joke, but like you possibly could like portion it down and make a yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, so. what I like about this is it's got it's got all those like thirty tons of cooking apples and ten thousand pounds of sugar, and then it just has one clove. <laughs> <laughs> you only need one. Yeah, it's probably already too much. <laughs> yeah. You just have to say clove near the, the pie and that's enough clove. Yeah, like a tincture oh, of no. clove. I like a Yeah. It's homeopathic clove. <laughs> uh, I also love the accompanying thing, which is where they make the crow-shaped whistling thing that you put in the middle of the pie to let out some of the hot air. But that was enormous as well. And then they erect it as a statue to the people who died in the attempt to make the pie. <laughs> <laughs> it was, oh, I thought that was so funny. That was a nice bit of relief because I was reading it through. I, I didn't flick through it much at the start. I sort of was just reading through the recipes uh, from front to back, trying to figure out what one I wanted. And I kind of got to that and I was like, oh, here's a bit of comic relief for me. Because there's jokes in all the recipes, but I was also like, but I'm not, I'm not a very, I'm, well, I'm an okay cook, right? But I, I generally, I always cook things from recipes most of the time. There's a few that I know well enough to cook without one. But, uh, and I've been doing a lot more cooking over the last year. So I feel like I've been training up for this. <laughs> but it, it was, yeah, it was just a nice little, little break in the middle of the, it's the cooking interesting, section. interesting, isn't it? Because, like, when I was reading this, because I did that after I'd flicked around and found the recipe and that, I sat down and read the whole thing. And there was that, that kind of dissonance of, oh, this is a real recipe of going, mm -hmm. there are all the jokes and there are jokes in the setup and there are jokes afterwards. But some of it is just recipes. Like, that, it was quite a... Um, you know, when you go and if you're listening to someone and you expect them to be funny and they're not funny, you're like, oh, hang on, I thought there were going to be jokes kind of thing. I had little moments of that with the recipes of still loving the book, but just going, oh, no, it really is just about, oh, no, it's just about making a dessert. Like, it was a strange, like, lumpy or uneven kind of reading it all the way through is a weird thing. Mm. Yeah, because this is the first time I've ever read this book. I didn't know what to expect. I hadn't read up on it beforehand. I just deliberately kind of, when I knew it was coming up, I was like, no, let it be a surprise or an astonishment of the celery persuasion, perhaps. <laughs> um, and I didn't know whether it would actually be like recipes you could really cook or if it was going to be like a bit of a narrative, but mostly jokes or whatnot. So I was actually really taken aback by how much it is legitimately a cookbook. And I guess... In that way, it's not really designed to be read cover to cover, though if you're a mm. fan of the series, that is absolutely how you would do it, because you wouldn't sort of be like, oh, well, it's just a cookbook, as in, like, in quotation marks, because a lot of work goes into making a cookbook. So it's a strange experience, because there's no, like, correct way to read it, because you do mm. want to read it like a book, because there is the book-ending stuff, and there's a lot of jokes in it. But as you say, it's an uneven read, but necessarily so, because it is a genuine recipe book as well so i guess you have to mm. choose your approach from the beginning like whether you're going to mm. treat it kind of like a novel with extra bits or as a recipe book where you just dip in and out um from the contents page and also is it a recipe book that you'd ever go to going oh, i just want to cook something <laughs> like the, there has to be that kind of venn diagram of you have to be a terry pratchett fan who likes to eat kind of thing yeah but yeah like it's so like, I would not, for example, going, I'm so bored of cooking the same things. I wonder what Nanny Og has got to tell me. Like, like it would. <laughs> yeah. 
you don't know how it's going to go down. But I, on that note, I think it's also it's quite an old school style cookbook, right? Mm. It's not like a modern one which has very sort of sequential instructions that are often written with maybe someone hasn't done a lot of cooking, but let's make sure there's enough instructions for them here. This feels like something written in the 70s or 80s where the assumption is you kind of know how to cook. This is just sort of how to cook this particular thing. Like we're not going to spell it out for you. Yeah. And as someone who has cooked a lot of things from modern style recipes, this was, you know, I I made some mistakes. (laughs) I, I could have used a little more guidance from Nanny, but, you know, I did okay, I think. But it's, it also reminded me of Kuma books. Like the Pratchett one it reminded me most of was The Unadulterated Cat, which is not a novel and it's not, it's not really nonfiction either. It's just sort of a collection of humorous stuff. Yeah. And we don't, people don't really write those much anymore. Like they were big in the 80s. It's kind of like toilet reading. You know what I mean? Like yeah. You get those little amusing books that you kind of flick through when you're at someone else's house. They always seem to have the pile of them in the loo kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like you say, it's exactly, it's kind of like a muesli book. Like there's lots of little bits and pieces, but it's not all the same flavor. <laughs> yeah. And now nowadays people go to the internet for that kind of yeah. stuff. So we don't print books like that so much anymore. I felt very much in my comfort zone because like my mom has this big rack of cookbooks um, in the house that I grew up with and they or magazines, like that kind of weird mix of cookbook magazines. And they are all like from the 70s and 80s and 90s and they are all kind of written like this. So that is kind of how I learned to cook. If I wanted to make a cake or something, I'd go to the rack and find the Baking Delicious Cakes one or the, the horrifying 70s centerpiece one if I wanted to like really sort of scar myself horribly. Um, and so this felt like, yeah, this is a proper cookbook to me because it's what I'm used to. But I do, abs- just going back to your point, Cal, I love the idea of someone who's not a Pratchett fan who somehow has ended up with this book in their collection for whatever reason, like a housemate has left it there or they've been gifted it or they picked it up off the shelf going, okay, tonight what am I going to have for dinner? Yeah, this one. And then just like cook it with no context of any of the other things and yep. just be like, oh, there's a joke there. Oh, well, I'm just going to brush right past that and it's just yeah there's a special kind of joy to imagining yeah. that what would be the weirdest thing for them to come across if that was what that was happening probably probably the pie yeah the bloody <laughs> stupid johnson's giant pie <laughs> <laughs> you'd bounce off that pretty quick i think because well also because it's the only one that doesn't have metric measurements frog pills the clatchian curry yeah. like the how wonderland curry oh yeah i thought i did quite well at geography at school but i guess this is a country i don't know about yeah or, or taking nanny og at face value of being like what an unusual woman like yeah where's her wikipedia page i wonder <laughs> well they would find one for some reason this is taking place in the 70s in my mind so they're not looking up wikipedia yeah. <laughs> oh okay mm. yep makes sense thick and haddock maybe it'd be a good one yeah or any of the dwarf cookery <laughs> I am so keen to do some dwarf cookery. But like making something for their kids' sports day, they're like, oh, yes, I'll make some uh, some of this dwarf bread. <laughs> kids will like that. Yep, they'll be use it, able to use it for discus. It'll be good. <laughs> and it's also, I mean, because the kind of recipes that have been selected for it, and Nanny Og addresses this, where she talks about there's all this fancy foreign cuisine, but what's wrong with, like, good old, you know, ank more porky and lanker cuisine? <laughs> And it's that feeling of, well, there's all these traditional English foods that yep. maybe we could still eat. Like, And, and some of them are in here. Like, there's a spotted dick in here. There's, uh, there's a couple other things that sort of fit into that mould. And most of the things sort of really kind of suit that sort of yeah. attitude. Nanny would love a spotted dick. Yes. And the element of stodge. Like, you do. I mean, you definitely. Yes. This is, this is not Italian nanny og. <laughs> no. This is get some starch into you. I would also read that cookbook. Yes, totally. <laughs> oh, yeah, that would be amazing. Suet featured quite heavily, and I was like, I don't even know where I'd get that. Yeah, what is suet? Is suet kind of lard? I, is that what yeah. it is? Or is it... Oh, when we did The Fifth Elephant, which is the book that came out at the same time as this, and that book, you know, they, they go to where the fat is mined in Uberbold. That's right, yeah. Um, and it talks about all these different kinds of fat, and I looked them all up. Like, some of them are refined fat, some of them are fat from particular kinds of animals. I forget which one suet is. It's the raw, hard fat of beef, lamb, or mutton found around the loins and kidneys. So it is absolutely the worst thing you can imagine. (laughs) But there's also vegetable suet, I found out. Like you can, there's a vegetarian version of it because I went through. If you want to recreate that foulness. Yeah. Yeah. I think they might mention it in there, but I went through and had a look to see which ones could also be vegetarian. 
Yeah, it was also a bit of an experience reading this book as a vegetarian and going, okay, no, not that one, uh, not that one, <laughs> not this one. But then I was surprised that actually there's quite a few things mm. in there that I could cook and eat. And some, as you say, Liz, that are quite easily adaptable. So I was really pleasantly surprised by that. Uh, but there's also quite a lot of beef <laughs> in there. There's plenty mutton. of beef. I think mutton is never a good, like, I'm never excited to hear anything's got mutton yeah. involved no. in it. It just sounds yeah. like you're living in a snowed-in, decrepit castle in the middle of nowhere and it's yeah. the Middle Ages and it's on a stick and there's going to be a brawl any moment now and mutton yeah. is there. And mutton was probably a 17-year-old sheep. Like it, was, it, wasn't, it hasn't just aged into mutton from lamb. Like it's been yeah. firmly there for years. Mm. Yeah. It's like probably they, they just died of old age. Like they just they didn't yeah. even. Yeah. Died of anger yeah. and old age. Like it just seems like an angry <laughs> yeah. meat. Yep. It's fed up. You can taste it. Yeah. We'll talk about the ones, because we all did try cooking one or making one. Yes. Um, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but are there any other ones that we haven't made that we're just really excited about? I want to talk about um, Dibbler's Sausage in a Bun, because I love the oh, footnotes yes. for that. <laughs> yes. 1.4 kilograms of top quality pork, minced, footnote. Note from Mr. Dibbler, I always use good quality pork with about two thirds lean meat to one third fat. I insist that any skin, gristle, or other dubious parts of the beast are excluded from the mixture. Then there's a footnote coming off that that says, This is what he says, and I, for one, believe it. It's not good etiquette to look at one of his sausages and say, Woof, woof, or nay. (laughs) (laughs) Such snark. I love it. Sausage in a bun is the thing I think about the most often. Like, if we ever go to Bunnings and there's, like, Digby wants a... I just always think sausage in a bun. Like, it's like a... I don't know, like one of those little reference points or something. It just really resonated so so yeah. deeply with me. <laughs> it's like a was it the thing that like a widget or something that runs automatically? Like one thing happens and then like automatically. Oh it comes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I wonder. I mean, he wouldn't make it in Australia because like everyone would just be at Bunnings. He wouldn't be yeah. able to. Or would he just show up at every at every Bunnings? There'd be one of the Dibblers because we know there's like heaps yeah. of different ones all over the world. In every community group that comes to South Sausages, there's a Dibbler. There's a Dibbler <laughs> descendant in there somewhere. <laughs> and well, you know how they're for charities. Maybe like in a Discworld Bunnings version, he'd just be pretending like he'd have like a whole bunch of different <laughs> pretend. Charities, charities that it's for. Yeah. <laughs> but it all probably, you know, <laughs> my instant reaction is, no, that he wouldn't go that far. And I'm like, I have nothing to bait. Like, nothing in the book suggests that that is too far for, for CMOT Dibbler. But I feel in my heart that stealing from a charity or pretending to be a charity might but just be a step be too far. But he would be the charity. Like, he would feel justified in that it was he was the Dibbler receiving the charity. That mm. is how he would get around it. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And it was sausage in a Bunnings. <laughs> Sausage and bunnings. Oh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to... Okay. Now I want to do a logo that is sausage in a bun. Yeah, we, that is a t-shirt. That's a t-shirt it's waiting a to happen. T-shirt. Very niche Australian Discworld fan <laughs> t-shirt, but I think I think it would be a hit. Yeah, the- Seven of us will be very happy. <laughs> uh, listener, if you would like us to make and sell those t-shirts with a, a portion of the proceeds going to the Cal Wilson charity, then um, <laughs> please let us know. We'll do it. I have um, to. I have to um, help my cats uh, pay their rent at their cafe. So, um, <laughs> got to keep yeah. them in cold brew. Yeah. <laughs> Were there any that caught your eye, Cal? Uh, I'd like. I, I like the whole genre of dwarf cookery, as I said before. But like, just yeah. what I love is dwarfish drop scones. So drop scones are a thing. Like you yes. know, you know, that's the thing that grandmothers make at drop scones. But that it's the drop scone was one of the most feared of the battle breeds, heavy enough to do serious damage if dropped from a height of six inches and aerodynamic enough to stun an opponent at a distance of hurled from a sling. Like how just that beautiful, oh, a drop scone. It's like, oh, right, yeah, like a battle bred. How fantastic. Just the simplicity of the joke, but that it also works so beautifully. I always admire Pratchett's ability to take one joke and then just iterate on it and run with it and take it as far as possible. Like he started with what's the opposite of elf bred? Okay, bread that keeps you going because it's so hard you don't want to eat it. You'll eat anything else. <laughs> and they're like, but then wh- how many bread puns can I do? And there's several jokes in this book where he uses the fact that the French word for bread is is pan or pain. Pain, yep, yep. And then just uses that as a pun like three or four times in different contexts. I love it. Yeah, they were really good. I appreciate some of these were kind of deep cuts. If you haven't read Discworld books for a while, you might not remember where they're from. Mm. And, you know, I mean, we do this podcast, so I'm always thinking about Discworld these days, which is not a chore. But the first one being the Deep Sea Blowfish, and I have a vivid memory of this because I directed a play version of Mort when I was in university. 
And so there's that scene where they're passing the blowfish back and forth between the vizier and the young emperor. And I'm like, this is that. This is like from the fourth book that you wrote. This is how could you, you could not have imagined that, you know, 15, 20 years later, you'd be writing that into a recipe book. Yep. <laughs> so weird. There's a lot of glee in this, like precisely that of going, oh, we can bring this back. We can we can reincorporate those jokes or we can carry it. Like it's the longest running running gag. Like yeah. I, I feel like there was a lot of enjoyment in creating this. Yeah. One of the reasons for this level of enjoyment is the involvement of photographer and Discworld mega fan Tina Hannon, also known as Misty. We didn't talk much about her this episode, mostly because finding out about her required a bit of digging. But Misty was very well known to the UK Discworld fan scene in the 90s and 2000s. In 1997, Misty met Pratchett at two different events. First, she impressed him with her Sergeant Angua cosplay, but on the second occasion, she presented him with some dwarf bread, figgins, and a sticky toffee rat on a stick. The story goes he challenged her on the spot to come up with enough recipes to fill a book. And she did! Another possible reason for the fun is that the cookbook was conceived not as a money-making exercise, but as a fundraiser for the Orangutan Foundation, whom Misty helped support via various convention activities for many years. And of course, it's also a cause close to Pratchett's heart. But while we could find a fair few sources saying that Misty's share of royalties go to the Foundation, we could only find a few saying that this was the case for everyone who worked on the book, and none of those were official. Plus, it's the sort of thing that's usually mentioned in or on the book itself, and it isn't. If you know the truth of this state of affairs, please let us know. And then there's some things that the original joke is just the mention of the name of the thing, like the banana soup surprise. Banana where it's just like one line joke. <laughs> banana and a soup surprise, sorry. It's very difficult to pronounce weirdly. <laughs> it's easy to write wrong. It's harder to say wrong. But yeah, just stuff like that and the celery astonishment, like... They're just mentioned, but then they've gone, let's turn it into a recipe. <laughs> yeah, and you're great. Like, what? Yeah, it's so the best, great. The best title has to be, though, Nanny Og's Perfectly Innocent Porridge with Completely Inoffensive Honey Mixture, which shouldn't make anyone's wife laugh. And it has, like, one of my favorite pictures of all of them, which is just, like, the grumpy man oh, yeah. making this porridge in front of a bunch of cats. <laughs> yeah. And I was reading this being like, oh, like, wh what's the joke? I don't, I, I don't know, like, there's the whole thing about the guy's wife laughing at all the things, but then there's that little line that's like, note, the honey mixture may also be used in a hot toddy, spooned over ice cream, sorbet, or the person of your choice. And then there's a note in there that says, I find it hard to see why anyone would want honey smeared all over them, but my wife refused to make any comment, so I suppose we might as well leave this in. <laughs> so so many undercurrents in this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Her presence is there, because like, she, she's only talked about, but she's so strongly throughout this book, it's just great. Yeah. The other thing that I really loved was that there is a strawberry wobbler. Yes. That there's, you, oh, you can make them. <laughs> and they would indeed in. look hilarious. Yeah. And I like that, you know, when it's talking about it serves however many, and then it says depends on the size of your flute, uh, as in your champagne flute that you're using as a mold. I thought, <laughs> very, mm. very cheeky. Uh, but I love they, they just found ways to get illustrations of all these Discworld characters in here as well. And I think all of the illustrations in here are new ones. I'll have to check that out. Like, I don't think they're reused from other things. But that grumpy old man, that's Albert. Oh, from, uh, his porridge, oh. right. The cats make sense now too. Yeah. And it's not his porridge that we're making, but he, you know, does famously make porridge. And then the other thing with the honey mixture, you've got Casson under the dwarf with his paintbrush loaded up with honey threatening romance there's just some such great pictures my yeah. favorite ones though if we're talking about the pictures have got to be the various little imps that are automating the kitchen devices like there's the one on the the like egg beater there's the one who's grating the nutmeg oh yeah uh, on the back. Yep. yeah and then right at the end of the book and I didn't notice this until I'd finally finished reading it but right at the end there's two pictures there's one of Nanny Og just hugging Grebo and then on the very last page, there's a picture of Grebo clearly having just eaten the imps. I have, I'm only just seeing that now. I was horrified and also found it very hilarious at the same time. That's great. We also missed that. But we should talk about the etiquette section before we get on to what we actually cooked. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know what to think about this section. I was like, Nanny Og doesn't care about etiquette, That's does she? so good. 
yeah, but then I read that her introduction to it and I was converted. I was like, oh no, I get it. And I think the thing that struck me was when she talks about, isn't it just a way of making you look stupid if you don't know the rules? And I say, ah, but at least there are rules and they're all written down where anyone can find them. And that's like a kind of a practical approach to this, which is like some of these rules are dumb, but at least we all have rules about how to interact with each other in these weird situations. And if you can figure them out, you'll be okay. I thought that's that's quite an interesting way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah, and and I also like the way she just manages to shoehorn why a witch should be invited to every occasion. <laughs> like like if there's a you know if there's a witch with an empty beer glass, that that's really good. Yeah. The or, number of ways in which it's lucky to give nice things to witches yeah. is uncountable in this book. <laughs> if they happen to show up when you're baking, um which is quite often, then <laughs> <laughs> somehow they know. Somehow. And, and again, the earth, the earthiness of Nanny Og was it was it um, full force in this. The, my, my thing that made me laugh the most was in the courtship section where she's talking about her first, um, the first Mister Og, and how um, she kept on collecting logs from where he was working outside. And I just love the way she said. Uh, uh, so she's set up the situation and then she said, it made me laugh so much I dropped a log on my foot and he had to help me indoors. After that, one thing led to another, and he's called Jason. Yeah. <laughs> That's that beautiful, <laughs> beautiful <sighs> underselling of what's just happened. And the way that she describes it as he's the one who was good at finding a good moment, whereas she was the one constantly going out to the wood pile while he was working outside with his shirt off yep. until he eventually said something which was not at all romantic. Mm, got the <laughs> runs, was... have you? Yes. It was so good. <laughs> uh, yeah. Wedding anniversaries list I found delightful. Yes. Oh, that was great. Because it's just yeah. like by committee as well. Because like the real one is also, or the real one, like the one in our world is just, just as weird. Like they're all like, they don't make sense or whatnot. So I'd much rather go with Nanny Ogg's one. It's like 30th lobster or crayfish or 35th. Picture of a sad green negation lady because you know exactly what picture she means. Yes, yeah. Yes. And the one that made me laugh was stuffed donkey in straw hat because I was like, oh yeah, my parents had one of those. Like, but it's, <laughs> it's so that beautiful thing of it's so close to what it really is, but in a wonderful unhinged way. And yeah. in a classic like Nanny Ogg's style, like 55th is a four poster bed. Which um, goes really well with her etiquette on the bedroom bit where you're desperately trying to read around the notes that are pinned yeah. over the top yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah. And there's just one about like, and you yeah. had the goat tied to the bedpost. Is you can make that out between. <laughs> but yeah, it's great. <laughs> oh, <sighs> man. Yeah, I enjoyed that. I think, look, most of this section is hilarious. I enjoyed the section about the language of flowers, Mm. where she doesn't go into any real flowers and what they really mean. Instead, it's just, there's just this list of all these made up Discworld flowers that have like incredibly suggestive names. And this idea that a woman was so offended just by this creepy guy's garden because it was filthy. Yeah. Because of all the meaning of all the flowers put next to each other. Just hilarious. And again, that kind of undercutting thing of like she's um, talking about the floral walk, which someone has planted through his estate after he'd been forced to reopen an ancient footpath. Like the idea that he's like giving a big up yours to everyone in the flowers, like beautiful. (laughs) Malicious compliance. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So good. I really appreciate that there was a separate section for etiquette with witches and then another one for etiquette with Granny Weatherwax. Yeah. (laughs) And the topics you can talk to her about. So good. (laughs) And I love the bit about the scarecrow, Unlucky Charlie. Yes. Who, I don't know, have you read the short story, The Sea and Little Fishes? No. It's not very short. It's more, it's more like a, a very short novella than a short story, but it's great. It's about, it introduces the idea of the witch trials that later comes up in the Tiffany Aching books. And I think that's where they introduce the, the scarecrow as like the thing that they practice their magic on. And I was just reading that going, this is cool. This detail about him is not in that story. Like yeah, they've invented yeah. all that for here. Because I, I was worried looking at it. I was like, are they just going to reuse some jokes from the books? And there are a few recycled ones here and there. But, you know, in that Pratchetty way where he's given it a bit of a new context yeah. and a bit of a polish. And it's it's not the same. But it's like an old friend who's got a new suit on, you know, uh, and is looking good. And you're like, oh, nice to see you. I really liked that there was that new stuff in there as well. Um, and there's a great bit with the dealing with the undead section, which I really loved, where yeah. uh, she's talking about vampires. 
And I just love the sensible tips, which are one, don't go anywhere near a vampire's castle, no matter how bad the weather. Two, having gone near the castle, don't knock at the huge forbidding door. Three, yeah. having knocked at the huge forbidding door. Like, I just love, I love that escalation of like, we all know you're going to do it. It's great. Yeah. When I was reading this, I thought of both of you because at the start of the werewolf section, she says, and people say to me, werewolves aren't undead. And in our very first episode, both of you exclaimed that you didn't think they were undead. They were more like twice as alive. It's true. Here she is addressing it. It's like she listened to our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, no, they are. Let me justify that. And look, her justification is perfectly fine. Like, unless you use the special implements, they can't die. So it's like, all right, okay. I still don't think they're undead, but I get why. Yep. On the disc world, that term is maybe a bit looser than in, say, Dungeons and Dragons. I also feel like a lot of this is based on research into the folklore behind a lot of English, particularly, mm -hmm. traditions. And I wonder, this has been translated into other languages, so I'd be fascinated to know how much of this makes sense in other places where the traditions are quite different. I guess people would yeah. just be like, wow, they're really weird on the disc world. <laughs> But the way that some of them are twisted for the Discworld, like the, the Lanka love seat, which feels oh, yeah. like it's a weird version of the Welsh love spoon, you know, those wooden spoons yep. that they carve for each other in Wales. It just felt like this is a weird Discworld evolution of that. I love the potpourri thing. That was great. <laughs> yeah. So uh, traditionally the way to make it potpourri is with lavender and other kind of organic matter but then the recipe for potpourri is anything dry twigs wood shavings unlucky frogs bits of old beetle some brightly colored paints some cheap scent paint the dry stuff and scatter scent on it that's all they do to make the expensive stuff you see in shops after all and that is absolutely right yeah. <laughs> it was like in the 90s was this like in the late yeah. 90s late 90s 1999 because yeah. potpourri was huge then so it's very yes. very topical yeah. I remember my mum making it because we in our first house in Australia we had a big rose garden so she collected all the all the petals off them as they were signed and then like dried them all out and we had potpourri around for ages and it was nicer than nanny ogs, I think. Yeah, the 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 coloured wood shavings that you get in garden shops. Like the you know, like the yeah. Oh, we're at a garden centre, but here's a indoor stuff shop. Mm. Yeah. You know, it's probably not very good, is it? <laughs> It's made out of recycled outdoor stuff, is yeah. what it is. Uh, which, look, is a good use for those things, I guess. Is it? Um, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Um, oh, I don't know. Does anyone need um, potpourri? Yeah. I well, we, Mum had pomandas when I was growing up. What is that? A pomander is like a an orange with cloves stuck in it on a oh, ribbon. Yeah. And you put it in your wardrobe or your drawers. It was, it was like another old English thing that you did to... Keep things smelling fresh. Does it go on like like a cloth bag kind of thing yeah, to hang you... it, and you hang it up in that or something? Or am I thinking of you something? Can do else like maybe? bags of lavender and stuff. The, the pomander I remember that we had was like um, there was like a, it was like a dead orange with covered in clothes, so like a <laughs> battle mace kind of thing, but on a ribbon. And yeah. she had like a a blue china ball that you stuffed smelly things into as well, and it had little vents, and you supposed to hang that in the wardrobe. Not that our wardrobes are particularly disgusting, but that's just what I remember. It does sound mm. like it would smell nice. Like, it does actually sound like it would smell nice. Did it? Mm. It smelled. Like, it was a, I mean, clothes are strong. <laughs> when you only need you one clove with 30,000 pounds of flour. <laughs> you couldn't smell any of the other smells. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> which is kind of the point, I suppose. Fun fact, it was only like this year or last year that I learned that LB is like pounds. I was like, my whole life in my brain, I've been going libs, like the whole time. <laughs> Are you going to bake 10,000 libs into a pie? Yeah. Well. well. I mean, look, I don't know that we'd object. Uh, no judgment. No judgment. I There's a few bits in this book that are interesting kind of peeks at what was going to come in the Discworld books. Like uh, there's the section on stamps and how where you put it on the envelope, it means different things. But this is written before going postal. Mm. So... Kind of depending on, I mean, you can kind of retcon it in your brain and go, okay, well, obviously the book was released in our world before that, but clearly they'd had stamps. But she talks, it doesn't quite make sense because she's talking about stamps as though they're an old tradition, mm. whereas they're freshly invented in uh, in going postal. So there's some stuff there that is like, well, I guess you can't, but that's the Discworld all over. You can't take the continuity too seriously yeah. or it doesn't really work. Plus they do some but, weird uh, time stuff when they're the witches. So maybe there's like a well, fold that's... and it's come back around and she's seen it and it is a tradition, but it hasn't happened yet, but it has. 
or maybe it was, and then the whole thief of time thing happened, and now it's been erased. Mm-hmm. And yeah, but I I I love that because it's so complicated. It's like oh, if you put it in the middle at the top, that means you're asking this. And if you put it down the bottom, I was like, no, we knew, you're not. Also, I was kind of worried because I'm like, no, you have to put it in the top right hand corner, or they might not send it. <laughs> <laughs> like, don't give people bad advice. Um, but I thought that was great. And also the just the way that the etiquette section sort of flip flops between good advice and just taking the piss out of traditional etiquette advice mm. I thought was great as well. I really enjoyed that. What's the ones like give her a piece not in the book, but like there's like there's a that's done the rounds from old etiquette books is like give a woman a piece of cheese to fascinate her. <laughs> that's right. I remember seeing that. <laughs> I'm like, that would fascinate me. That would work. <laughs> Most of the people I've seen posting that are like, yes, please give me some yes. cheese. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, if, you, if all you're expecting is fascination, like it's an easy goal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So more of that, please. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it kind of, it ends on a nice note. Grebo eating the imps. <laughs> well, that's, that's a bit <laughs> horrifying. But the afterwards kind of a nice, it's not full of jokes. It's kind of just a nice gentle, thanks for reading this book. And I hope you've learned a few things. But there's, you know, there's a couple of jokes in it. But it was it was good. Hmm. Are there any other favourite bits we want to discuss before we talk about some actual cooking that we've done and then get on to questions? Oh, it's all a favourite bit. I guess. Mm. Leonard Quim's uh, oh. recipe for a cheese sandwich is lovely. <laughs> so good. Just that stream of consciousness arrival at not making a sandwich. Yeah. And also his inability to name things yes. well on full display. <laughs> yep. But also there's the bit at the end where he just casually mentions invent a machine that can take you to the moon powered by eggs. And I'm like, I believe it. I believe you yep. can do it, buddy. <laughs> and then just leaves it. Just leaves it. Goes somewhere else. Yeah. It's good because you could take a chicken with you and so you would just have a <laughs> constant source. You'd have company in a self-regenerating <laughs> rocket. It's very eco-friendly. Which comes first, the moon or the egg? <laughs> That's the question. Maybe the moon is a big egg and you need it to come back. Well, I'm sure we'll, we'll think of any other things. I think if there's anything we've forgotten, and of course we can't talk about everything. If you want to, if you want to know everything that's in the book, you've got to read it, right? Mm-hmm. But but we do want to share some practical experience of having made some of these recipes. Being a vegetarian, and also I empathised with uh, Rinswin's love of potatoes. I don't know if that's the <laughs> Irish in me, but I just I really love them. And you see, my partner who's Finnish really just does not want to eat any more potatoes in her life because boring boiled potatoes was a very common staple of Finnish cuisine. So we don't eat them much at home. So I was like, I'm going to take this opportunity. I'm going to make Rinswin's potato cakes. They're very simple. I doubled the recipe because I was, wasn't was sure it would make enough. But then I also didn't really, I, I kind of missed, you know, it's got the portions, like how many people it feeds at the top of the mm-hmm. ingredients list. I kind of missed that. And it says you're supposed to make six to eight out of the normal one. And I only made about six or seven of them out of the doubled recipe. So they're all too big and they fell apart a little bit. But I got to say, for a recipe that is just some mashed potatoes with some sage and fried onions in, dipped in breadcrumbs and fried, Bloody delicious. Hmm. It was so good. It turned out really well, apart from me making them too big and them falling apart. And I did take some photos, so I'll share those, listener, um, on our website. It was kind of fun. It felt like a bit, it felt kind of old school. And again, yeah. you know, I'm used to the real detailed instructions. And this literally just says 350 grams of potatoes cooked and mashed. Now, normally when I mash potatoes, I put like butter and milk and stuff in them. But I was like, well, do I do that for this or do I just mash the potatoes? And then I was sort of like, I'll just do it without, I'll just, I won't add anything to them except what it says. And it turned out pretty good, but I made them too big. But other than that, they're really good. I recommend. What a lovely outcome hmm? that yeah. I did not share. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, so I did sticky toffee rat on a stick. Oof. Oh, dear. Because I was like, what is something that's relatively simple that is also intriguing to me? And I do like a dessert. So the ingredients are 500 grams of white marzipan, a strawberry licorice boot lace for the rat's tail, mm-hmm. um, a small jar of toffee spread, chocolate sprinkles, blah, 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 blah. So for a start, I couldn't find the strawberry boot lace for the tail. And I was quite disturbed about that because I wanted to be... Strict to the recipe, but I went with a purple snake instead. So I got a snake lolly. Marzipan, I only made one rat. You're supposed to make four, but I only made one rat because I felt mm. somehow I had a, a like an inkling that it was not going to be the most delicious thing I'd ever made. 
because sure. what you do is you, you make the marzipan into the shape of a rat, put the tail up its butt, and then coat it with a thin layer of toffee spread. I could not find toffee spread as a concept in the supermarket, so I got like dolce de leche, like a sticky kind of spread, which I painted mm. on the rat shape and then rolled it in the chocolate sprinkles. But the marzipan was not um, – it was quite relaxed, like it wasn't going to retain its shape Oh, no. Very well. So it was kind of, it was hard to roll them in the chocolate sprinkles. I cut up more bits of snake for the eyes and nose, which was fine, and then stuck a cocktail skewer up its bottom. Was excited by the toffee that I made out of the boiling sugar and water. That went really well. But then I poured it over the rat, and it did uh, look like it was mummified. I'm going to hold up... Um, Oh, oh no! Oh, oh, oh no! Oh good <laughs> lord! But that is a that is a stronger reaction than I was hoping for. But that is also wow. an excellent reaction. So it does look like <laughs> a uh, it's been. It looks like a crime. It looks like it's been mummified in an attic for a number of years. So it's brown. It's got kind Stop of sticky showing. stuff. <laughs> Um, and then I wanted to pick it up and eat it on the stick, but the toffee stuck it to the plate. And then so as I tried to get it off with a knife, I just ended up sort of disemboweling the marzipan oh, rat. No. And then its head fell off. So I was like, well, I'll just eat the head. And it was disgusting. It was disgusting. Oh. Turns out I hate marzipan. It's just horrible old, like, it's like the underwear for icing on a cake, right? And you don't want to have the underwear with chocolate sprinkles and toffee. It was a complete disaster. Oh, no. Maybe you should Do have not recommend. added ketchup. Would that have helped? Oh, oh. I should, should have thought about it. I was distracted by the fact that the cat jumped on me while I was eating it, and I was like, maybe you're attracted by the fact it's a rat, but even he did not want to try any. Uh, so I have t- I've taken a photo, and I've got some video of it as well. Oh, wow. And I thought, I was, I was like, I'm going to do this really well. I'm going to video myself making it. But then I realized I had the camera in slightly wrong position. So you can sort of see me off to the side making something. And I'm not even really <laughs> on camera I... making the rat. So there's a really mm. nice bit of footage of me proudly showing no one something that you can't tell. <laughs> I, it is I, I totally sympathize. I tried filming myself making the potato. I mean, for start, it's not very interesting. It's just mashing some potatoes and frying some stuff in a frying pan. But I, I flipped it around to talk to the camera. And I've got this new phone that I'm not 100% used to. And I had it way too close to my face. So it's just like the top half of my face. <laughs> like, average yours out and it's like perfect. Yeah, amazing, <laughs> amazing camera work. <laughs> yeah, great. Great, uh, but I do have some some footage of it sizzling in the pan. But that photo is extraordinary. I want to when see I it saw again, it, actually, like, can you send it to us? Because it's... Yes. yeah, we'll oh, oh, share yes. it with you, listener. But when I saw it, I just felt like that is a rat that has fallen off a high building. Yeah, um, Oof, like yeah. that is not. Yeah, it really does look like a murder scene. Yeah, but it looks like a real rat as well. So well done. I mean, yeah, did a really good, good job of the shape. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, like rat special effects, hundred yeah. percent. But yeah, it does look like it's some of its innards have liquefied and come out. Cal, was your son there? Like, was he? Did he see this? Because I feel like that might be scarring for well, a young I, man. What I liked was he came in from a bit of a cricket practice and went, "Oh, something smells nice," and I showed him, and he went, "Not that." <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, I was like, great. "Do you want to try it?" And he was like, "In no way do I want to try it." Okay. Well, we've so far mixed success. We got a hit and a miss, but great effort. Thank you so much, Cal. That's amazing. Liz, how did you go? What did you cook? Right, so I made wow wow sauce, and I first want to apologize to our Discord advice giver who told me not to use Branson pickle because it had been recalled, but I had already made it by the time that they told us that using it. Um, oh, so no. I didn't eat it all. But basically, this is Red Cully's like special sauce for adding to things. Like they say beef, but it's it's one you could add to pretty much anything. Like you could put it on the well, not anything, like not cereal. I suppose, unless you're <laughs> ice cream. But yeah, if you're feeling particularly ambitious, maybe to a marzipan rat. Um, I don't know. Mm. I think it'd probably go well with your potato cakes, Ben. Actually, oh, but yeah. it is not vegetarian, that. so we're not going to do that. Oh, okay. But yeah, I ran into trouble immediately, like because it says it wants four pickled walnuts, and I was like, "What does that mean?" So I did some googling, and basically, I think in England you can buy pickled walnut, which is like. I didn't realize walnut could be like a green, fresh-looking thing, not a shriveled brain-looking thing. And it comes in a jar, and it's all um, <laughs> like pickled, like um, I don't know how to describe it. Like um, a pickled but, onion kind yeah. of thing. And I couldn't find it here. Like I looked in supermarket, like looked on the supermarket websites. I looked in the Queen Victoria markets to see if they had it. I tried to see if I could find like walnuts fresh to pickle them myself, if that was such a thing was possible. And it was not. And so I was like, well, I've got Branson pickle, and that's British, and that will probably do. 
but well, so, hang on. I don't, what is Branson pickle? I don't actually know what that is. It's just various like vegetables in this brown pickled sauce, and you put it on sandwiches, and it is absolutely delicious. Like my dad had it mm-hmm. in sandwiches growing up. He's from England, and that's why I've always had it around. So I was kind of like, oh well, I'll try it with this because it is like lumps of fruit and vegetable inside mm. a thing that's been preserved. Surely that will work with the thing. And like taste wise, it did. Unless I'm going to die from ingesting plastic, um, we'll find out that in short time. I actually don't think it's one of the ones that's recalled. Oh, this is what the recall was about? Yeah, but I haven't checked the dates and mine's actually been in there for a while so it's probably like, if it's going to kill me, it's probably because it's too old rather than because it's got plastic Mm. in it. Or it would have fought its way out of the fridge and got you by now. Like it would have Mm. become sentient and taken the initiative. I feel like Red Cully would be proud of me. (laughs) (laughs) It might have created from you a scene much like the rat that Cal made uh, (laughs) if it was after you. But yeah. okay, all right, yeah, no, so so you got the Branson pickle instead. Yeah, well, I already had that, so I was kind of like, well, let's just just do this um, with the things that I've got. It's actually really easy, except for the bit that you have to prepare in advance, which is the mushroom concentrate, which is straightforward enough to do. It's just like when you have to be organized enough to do something the day before, that's where I sort of run into strife. But I mean, I didn't realize you could do this with mushrooms. I previously thought that all you could do with mushrooms was cut them up and fry them or or not fry them, and that was the extent of mushrooms but you can actually make like a sauce that goes into it one quick thing about mushroom concentrate the recipe says to add some salt and that could mean literally anything because the idea is to sweat out mushrooms so that they become a bit liquidy mine turned out very salty and no regrets but a little bit more guidance than any og would be very much appreciated so basically once you've done all that it's just a whole lot of stirring which I love cooking, but I hate cooking that involves a lot of stirring because you can't watch TV, you can't really listen to anything because you're listening to the stove and the things going. So all you've got is your own thoughts for like... When... <laughs> That's a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. And so it says 10 minutes, but it took about 20. And you're just standing there staring and being like, what am I doing with my life? Like, what's going to happen in the world? Like, oh, there's how many new variants are going to be? Like, It's like distilled pandemic time, isn't it? Mm. Like, it's like the last two uh. years concentrated into 20 minutes of self-contemplation. Yeah, and it's like you're just creating your own void to stare into or stir into <laughs> for a really long time. Does it also stir into you? This is a stirring speech, but yeah, it's just, yeah, it's, um, if you don't want to be alone with your own thoughts, um, this is not the recipe for you, I think. <laughs> but um, okay. after that, it was actually pretty good. I'm a bit of a perfectionist, so I feel like the Branson pickle was not a winner. I was given the advice to use pickled onion. So I think I'm actually going to make it again. And this time also mm. add, like, because they said that this was not the, like, full Red Curly Wow Wow sauce experience. And I wanted to make mm. it a little bit more intense. Like, it's got mustard and pepper and things. But I've got a whole bunch of different chilies that I've like chili Ooh. powders that I've gotten. So I might yeah. um, try and make the next one a little bit more excruciating. Wow, so, wow. Okay. Yeah. I want to like fully push it to the next level. So we'll see how we go. The second time I made it, I did actually add some spice. I put some habanero powder in it and it tasted exactly the same. Maybe there was an aftertaste of like spiciness, but wow, our sauce absolutely just rejects any changes to it. So um Give it your best go, I reckon, but maybe it's not worth trying to add something. It wants to be what it wants to be. What is in it that makes it not vegetarian? I haven't, I didn't look too closely There's at beef it. beef stock, so you could probably oh, do vegetable stock, stock instead. And it um, has butter, so it's not vegan. Um, okay. Well, that's, I love that's that fine. you missed the beef, though. I know. I don't what know. kind of vegetarian are you? Well, I mean, it's beef stock. This is the thing, though. You get you a lot of the stock you buy now. It's, it says beef or chicken stock, but it's still vegetarian. It's yes, just really. Is it the muscle muscle stuff or muscle or whatever? Those are the ones I get. So yep. I could use that. I could get the beef one of that and use that. I had to specifically get beef stock actually because I didn't have any on hand. I had vegetable stock and I had chicken stock, and it's also got port, which is like delightful. But yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Well, that sounds great. I what, guess what did it taste like? Not as wowy as I'd have thought. <laughs> just one wow. Just wow sauce. But it was good. Like, it's absolutely something that I would have. Like, basically, huh. I chose this one because I looked at the ingredients and I don't know how, like, everyone else cooks, but, like, I choose things based on how, like, you, you piece together the ingredients and figure out how it will taste. Like, and I didn't mm. realize until, like, this year that that's not how everyone cooks. Mm. But yeah, I just sort of imagine how something's going to taste and sort of go, okay. Yeah, that's about what I expect, and it's, yeah, it's that's not what you asked, how, is it? How, but 
how how else would you, how else do you choose a recipe? I feel like that's the most sensible way to yeah. choose a recipe is to go I like those sound of those things together. I guess it's yeah. like when you're developing like a thing, like if you're adding things to a if you're making something from scratch and not from a recipe perhaps actually and you mm. imagine how things will taste together and you know how it will taste based on your experience of different flavours. So maybe that, but I don't know. Apparently not everyone thinks like that. But maybe I was wrong and I've spoken to the one person in the world who doesn't think like that. And actually, they are the weirdo and we are correct. So, yeah. So it's good. I actually think I would make it again and gift it to people and watch them eat it. Oh, well, I, if you make it vegetarian, <laughs> vegetarian, I will definitely try it. Did you eat it on something or did you just taste it? I just tasted it and then I got freaked out by the Branson pickle thing. But um, I'll probably have some more. Okay. So I'll make it again. <laughs> And I'll make a vegetarian version and you can try it and it'll be good. So here's the thing I regret not saying. The thing about Wow Wow sauce is it tastes like England, or at least the perception I have of going to British pubs as a child. So if you could walk into a classic English pub, sort of bottle the air, the atmosphere, the general sort of, for lack of a better word, vibe, this is pretty much exactly what it would taste like. All right. I'm yeah. excited about this. All right. Well, it sounds like we've got two out yeah, of three. Two, two out bad. of three is good. That's I, a pass. I feel like, yeah. Cal, though, yours was the best because it was just so like, like it's what you expect from a book like this, that every so often there will be something just so truly horrifying. I mean, maybe if I was like a pastry chef or something. Mm. I just don't think marzipan can taste good, though. Like as soon as you no. said marzipan. It's got to be because cause in my head, I've gone marzipan and my head has gone delicious fruitcake icing. And I've, you know, I enjoy that. No, it's but not no, like it's, that. The, it's the undergarment of the icing. Yeah. It's the, my grandmother likes marzipan. And I think it's one of those things that, like, your grandmother likes it and it's not good. Is it because <laughs> like, they were, like, made to you know eat it I mean? as a child and now they're just, like, used to it? That was all, that, I suppose, that was, was marzipan the pinnacle of deliciousness. But we've Probably. moved on from that now. And yeah. it's the base level of. Sugar's not as expensive as it used to be. Isn't there like two types of marzipan? Like there's the marzipan that goes around cakes, but there's like another sweet called marzipan that yeah, tastes maybe, different. Maybe, maybe that's what the what the issue is. Maybe I've got the wrong marzipan. Because it's made of it's it's like a, it's like made out of a nut paste, right? Like the ground up like almond paste. Yeah, but now I have um I still have nearly five hundred grams of marzipan left. So <laughs> good luck for Christmas, everybody. Hey, <laughs> Everyone's getting oh. toffee rats for Christmas. Yep. <laughs> stuck to a plate was- that you can keep. If you finish. <laughs> uh, yeah. I was surprised there was no, like, specific Hogswatch recipes in here, actually. Yeah. Like, there's things that you would eat at, like, a big dinner like you would have at Hogswatch. And uh, and more on that at the end of the episode. Let's know. But nothing specifically for that occasion. I thought that was a little bit unusual. But Well, if I was the publishers in this book, like the fake ones, or maybe the real ones, I would have, in the back of my mind, gone, if this one goes well, maybe we'll make a Hogswatch-specific mm. cookbook. Hmm. Well, I guess there's still room for that. Mm. But that does remind me of some of the questions that we've been mm. sending because we've got some great ones about this book, which we should have an attempt to answer. Liz, do you want to kick us off with some of those? So our first question comes from the Overland Project via Instagram. And please excuse the many emojis that I'm going to have to describe in my deadpan voice. So most practically edible and at least edibly practical. All right, let's give this a go. Is that a, a, a witch and an eggplant? I think that's a witch. A carrot? A banana? A cucumber, a peach, a mango, and possibly squid. I don't think there is any squid in it. Is it? But uh, so I think they're asking, what is the most practically edible recipe, and what is the least edibly practical? Wow. So which is which is the most one you could just you could practically make and eat, and what is the one that is the least least edible? Look, I'm going to go into bat for um, toffee rat on a stick. <laughs> As but the either least one of practical those. and edible. Either one of those. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yep. All right. I mean, look, I feel like the most practically edible one is the banana. Like, it's very practical. Mm. It even comes in its own wrapping. I'm surely the least edibly practical one is B.S. Johnson's yes, pie. absolutely. Mm. You um, can't eat that. And also the porridge, the innocent porridge with everything taken out of it <laughs> is literally just porridge. Yeah, it's very boring, yep. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Although I do want to kind of make this special honey mixture um, <laughs> just to see what that's like. It sounds delicious. You're going to make someone's wife laugh. <laughs> that's okay with me. I mean, hopefully, I think hopefully the podcast already does that. So you know, I'm not I'm not doing anything inappropriate. Somebody's wife, if you're listening, this one's for you. <laughs> Thanks. What do you think, Liz? Uh, I agree. Like, I was gonna like maybe the cheese sandwich is like the least practical because like of obvious reasons for the whole thing. Well, but he doesn't I... even get to the cheese sandwich, right? Exactly. He up, yeah. Sends out for pizza. Hmm. 
Pizza is a cheese sandwich. True. The, the one that I found the most alarming is the Engelbert's Enhancer, which is the raspberry drinking yogurt, cream soda, uh, and then Barocca, blackcurrant Barocca flavor mixed together for a hangover cure. Oof. Like I feel hungover reading the recipe. <laughs> like, you would not drink that unless you really were, would you? Yeah. I, w- I would give it a go though. It says mix the yogurt and cream soda in a pint mug, add the tablet, stand back and watch. When it has settled, drink it, then go back to bed. I would say go straight to hospital. (laughs) (laughs) I'd say the bread and water would be a practical one, except that in the recipe, it's clear you also have to be running more pork to have this fully be. (laughs) So it's not exactly practical. So good. So good. I enjoyed that. And a flagon of water. I'm like, oh, I can't be bothered Googling how much a flagon is. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a precise measurement. All right, so for the next question comes from Danny via Twitter. What recipe is missing from the book that you wished was there? I think, and I think Danny's sort of talking about like what Discworld recipe mm. do we wish was in there. And I, I feel like there's some in the later books that would have been great to see. I thought of, you know, in uh, Going Postal, when Moist goes to that super fancy restaurant, where he's going to have the date with the doorbell, I think there's a mention of what's on the menu there. And I'm kind of like, I want to know what that's like. Because we get the boiled boots recipe from the fancy restaurant in Hogfather in this book. But I don't know. I'd love to see something from that restaurant. I agree with you on the Hog's Watch thing of like, that Mm. there's not with the extremely alcoholic drink that we would celebrate with. That's the other thing, right? Where's all the, where's all the drinks? Yeah. Mm. I want I want the Discworld cocktail book. That'd be amazing. The Ogtail. The Ogtail <laughs> book. <laughs> it's mostly apples. <laughs> mostly. A lot of cider-based beverages. I've, see, I appreciate this. I've been getting back into uh, cloudy apple juice and spiced rum, huh. which is just a delightful summery drink. So I feel like that would fit in. I think Nanny Og would enjoy that. It's mostly apples <laughs> as well. It's fruit. Fruit's part of your five a day, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it's got spices in it. Um, what do you reckon, Liz? What would you like to see in here? I reckon I would love to see like a pub special from the Mended Drum, like kind of like a, mm. like maybe even like a three course, like deceptively fancy. Like, you know, when a pub has got really gentrified, I would love to see like the Mended Drum's new menu after it got mended, where they call like classic pub food, like a fancy twist of a thing and, and charge twice the price. So it's just um, what they'd have done for like sausages and mash, but like called something like, I don't know, bovine tubes on like crushed something like it's just yeah 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 Yeah. um like the deconstructed version (laughs) yeah yeah just how they would have approached it i think that could have been fun that kind of reminds me too there are like other restaurants and bars and stuff mentioned particularly in ain't more pork and uh you could see some recipes from them like beers what what kind of cocktails do they serve in beers like the bar for the undead or something from Hager's House of Ribs which i mean is just you know like a horribly fried business but you could make something fun for that or this one I just thought of, like on the Stow Plains, like where Mort is from, they famously just grow cabbages. There's no cabbage oh, recipe yes. in here. Oh, yeah. We need a fancy cabbage recipe. Or um... it to be a, a cabbage alcohol that had to be some kind oh. of... <laughs> like a vodka made from cabbage <laughs> like or something. Cabbage one. schnapps. Yeah. But like <laughs> made to look really nice. Like you put a bit of like a cabbage on the side of the glass. Yeah. And... Oh, or you yeah. drink it out of a cabbage leaf. <laughs> Oh, see, I feel uh, that's what I wish was in there. All right, maybe we can write this and do that. Yeah. That would be so good. <laughs> All right, so the next question comes from Graham W. Kidd via Twitter. Um, one, does it taste good? And two, who's doing the dishes? Well, the dishes are going to be soaking. So, <laughs> hey. left in to soak. I'm sure that this is a, quite a common thing. We have the thing in my house where whoever cooks, the other person cleans up and we try to alternate that. I did feel bad because I, not having done this recipe before and there was like lots of breadcrumbs and stuff, I did make quite a mess. But my partner did clean up after it. And she enjoyed them, which I was quite pleased by because I was like, you're not going to like this. This is potatoes. And she said, no, those are pretty good. So that worked out. Oh, and I didn't say, this is a quick tip. It tells you you need like one or two eggs for the normal amount. You beat that up and use that to make the breadcrumbs stick to the things. That's way too much egg. And I had some left, so I just like, oh, I'll just quickly scramble that and I'll have that. And we had Brinner, <laughs> breakfast dinner. It was great. <laughs> did you did you put like the extra breadcrumbs into the scrambled eggs just to like add body? Oh, I should have. I had way too many. Like I used twice what they said because I was doubling everything and I, oh, yeah. I didn't need to. I, I could have used the same amount, but there were some in the pan. 
and they were deliciously crunchy, uh, having been fried. <laughs> it was very good, actually. I'm just someone who can't enjoy like my meal unless all the dishes are clean. So I'm like, I clean as I go, pretty much. I do a bit of that, like definitely the like the pans that I'm done with, because it's often better if you clean them straight away, mm-hmm. like the things don't settle on them. I mean, some things you need to let dry out so you can scrub it off a bit easier, but other things it's better to clean them straight away. Mm. And so I try yeah. to do a bit of that. My husband's a clean as you go, and I'm a oh, what happened here afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. The next question comes from Karen Hash via Twitter. So, have you ever tried to take Nanny's advice on pressing your suit? <laughs> <laughs> That was so silly. I like that. But I also, like, it just made me think about when was the last time I ironed something. And actually, when I moved house last, I got rid of my iron and my ironing board because I hadn't used it in the three years I lived in the previous place. Wow. Well, I I had to iron something on Thursday when I did a corporate event with people Mm. in the same room. It was the first time I'd had to iron anything below the armpits (laughs) since the beginning of the pandemic. (laughs) But what happens at our house is we've got a really good steam iron. And the cats really love it because the ironing board gets really warm. So when I'm ironing something, I have to fight my way through two cats to because they come and try and sit on the ironing board while I'm ironing, which is dangerous. But if I'm ironing a dress and I'm ironing the top part of the dress, they will be like in the bottom part of the dress as if it's a hammock because it's nice and warm mm. in there. It's the most infuriating experience. No, that's horrendous. Have you ever done the old like put it on it's not fully dry and it's crinkled up so you're just like pulling on it and hoping that will do anything but it doesn't uh, yeah yeah pull, pull on it and then run the hair dryer over yourself yeah i do a bit of that too or i put a jumper over the top of it no one will ever know yes like that's, that's... <laughs> the heat of my body will dry this sufficiently <laughs> and take out all of the wrinkles <laughs> i specifically buy clothes that don't need ironing um because mm. i hate doing it so much and i'm terrible at it like i, I know you can improve by doing more of it but yeah, it's just a whole thing having to get it out and do all the stuff. Just Yeah. Mm. We just leave it up in the dining room. It just sits up in the dining room. And then if we have people over, the iron goes away and then it comes straight back out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did use it as like a temporary desk at one point during the first lockdown. I have done that as a standing desk with a computer on it so I can do a Zoom gig. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I only really iron if I'm sewing because, like, you have to get everything flat for that. But oh, yeah. once a garment is made, goodbye ironing is just never happening again. Enjoy the moment. Yeah. I really enjoyed that this is how she approached that phrase because we know what Nanny Og thinks about, you know, matters of romance, etc. We've got a pretty good idea, but she's never thought about it in such formal terms that this just totally goes over her head and like, oh, you mean ironing things? <laughs> like, I, just, I just thought that was delightful. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so the next question comes from Damien Smith via Twitter. What would your version of a veterinary's bread and water be? Mm. So like uh, the recipe where the secret is not the cooking at all, but something else entirely, I think is is kind of what Damien's getting at. Hmm. Hmm. I feel like it's like, you know, the question is, you know, how would you... How do you make a perfect podcast? And it's like, well, you know, you can, you know, go through all these things. You can read up on, try and get it the exact right length and put all the sections in the right order. And, the, you, you know, you can do all that stuff. Or you can just pick something that you actually care about and yeah. get good people on to talk about it who also care about it. And remember that it's a conversation that someone else is listening to so that it's not boring for them. <laughs> That's it. Okay. So, uh, so my vision of this is the most strategically brilliant thing I ever did when my son was a baby with food, very simple recipe. I convinced him that having a cup full of frozen peas was a treat. (laughs) So he would sit in his high chair and I would be like, it's just about dinner time. Do you want some frozen peas? And then I'd give him like (laughs) some frozen peas and he'd be like, I'm going to have frozen peas and like pick them off his tray and be really excited about it. And then not being able to believe the fact that he had a treat before dinner and then he would have his dinner. And I, as a kid, used to love frozen peas as a treat and it was only as an adult that I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Hold on. I think that that is genius. That is very good. Mm, minted peas also, frozen minted peas, delicious. A little cup, good. little cup full, hot day. A little bit sweet there. So I guess my I guess my answer is um, convince children. Lie to your children. That something that is good for them is actually a forbidden treat and then give it to them. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah. How do you get your kids to eat vegetables? Yeah, remarket vegetables. Don't hide them. <laughs> just remarket them. Just give them a spin. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I can't come up with anything. I haven't got anything as good as that. 
I think I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to pass or phone a friend. No, I'm not going to phone a friend today. Hey, so I'm going to read Bring this me. whole page of a book. <laughs> if you think of one later, you can let us know and I'll edit it in. I've got my best strategy yeah, I've ever done, great. but it's nothing to do with food. It's just about the best way I passed a physics test um, with deception rather than knowledge. Don't I want to tell me about that strategy. Yeah, tell Even us story. non-edible strategy sounds good. I mean, I talked about podcasting, so well, come on. I can't remember what the words were, but there was we were doing a physics test and we hadn't been given that much time to prepare for it. And there was a question where you had to do a, like a paragraph answer and there was a key word to it where it, I didn't know whether it was one thing or the other, but they were almost the same word with a couple of letters different. So I just did bad handwriting through the whole written section and made it ambiguous around those letters, which one it was. <laughs> And I got good marks for it, so it was good. Like, yeah. Wow. wow. That was, yeah, that's okay. the, the sneakiest thing I've ever done in a test. Very devious. That's kind of like, oh, just do And then, yeah. Open to interpretation. Is the dress yellow and brown or blue and white? <laughs> like, does the teacher think I'll know the answer or are they going to have to ask me at a time when I've had a chance to look it up? So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, very cunning. Yes. Okay, I think that qualifies. That's a good answer. Um, so the next question comes from Rob via Twitter. What's your favorite recipe and are there any recipes that you'd put in with appropriate names? So I think this is about like real recipes from our world that we would Discworldify rather than ones that are missing that are from the Discworld. Mm. I'd like to see some stuff that wasn't so reliant on... Actually, no, wait, no, I know exactly what it is because I got excited when I saw there was Clamour's Beefy Mite spread and I was like, oh, this is going to be like some homemade version of Vegemite, completely ignoring the word beef in the title <laughs> because, you know, I'm vegetarian, so it doesn't exist for me anymore. Uh, and then I read it and I was like, no, this is more like some unholy offspring of Bovril and something mm. else. I mean, I, I know that these sorts of spreads exist. It's like, I can't even remember what they call. called. There's one that's like an ox in the name and it's... Oh, yeah. Bonox or something. I don't know. But I would love to see the closest thing you can make to like homemade Vegemite and put that in there as like the thing from Forex that you make. Because there were no oh, Forexian recipes idea. in here. And I was sad about that. Oh, I would totally do fairy bread, but it would be minced up actual fairies. <laughs> <laughs> Grebo's Great. Would be, yeah, be like Grebo's favorite dinner. <laughs> oh, I love fairy bread. Oh, I just I just realized something. Speaking of like local stuff, like I made Rincewind's potato cakes and we didn't even talk about should they be called Rincewind's potato cakes or should they be called Rincewind's potato scallops. No, we're not we're not doing this. We're not we big can't debate do this. here in Australia. Fritters I'm on board with. That makes us so much more sense. Fritters. What is that what you call them in New Zealand, Cal? I think fritters, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, they're not quite fritters. This is a big listener. If you're not from Australia, you probably missed this because why would you know about it? But we have a, a thing that we get in fish and chip shops here, which is like a, a, a flattened... A slab of potato. Yeah, flattened slab of potato, a bit bigger than like a hamburger patty. It's flat, it's round, uh, it's coated in the same batter that you put like your fish in and then fried. And there's a big debate about whether they should be called potato scallops, which is what they're called in New South Wales, where I grew up. Weird. Or potato cakes, which is what most other places seem to call it. And I think either is fine, you know. You like, yeah, I think, we, I think it's fritters in New Zealand, I think. That works. Potato fritters. Also, pineapple fritters. Do you get pineapple fritters at a fish and chip shop here? You can, yeah. We used to get them where I grew mm. up. You don't get donuts cooked in the same oil as the fish and chips. I don't think so. Uh, which is the greatest thing ever made. <laughs> Wow. Yep. That sounds That's so the thing I wow. miss the most about fish and chip shops here is you can't get a jam you can't get a donut, hot donut. Two fish, a scoop, and a hot donut. Wow. That sounds amazing. It, it, no, yeah, what? I mean it sounds it, my husband thought it was gonna be foul, but now whenever we go back to New Zealand, it's like the first thing we have to have takeaway, we have to get donuts from a fish and chip shop. I mean that does, I, I wanna do it now. <laughs> I'm excited about that. <laughs> Uh, right. I'm sorry, I've derailed us. I've derailed us from this question, but I thought that was important that we settle that and I I think we are accepting of all names mm. for the foods. Um, but if you feel strongly, listener, let us know. <laughs> all right. So the final question comes from Sven via Discord. It's in multiple parts, and I'm going to read them all together. So for which dish from another Discord book would you like to have the recipe? And for which of the round world versions of this book, the original Nanny Og version? Also, why is there no Maggi instant soup recipe in the German translation? Um, and bonus question, what's your favorite flower with a wink wink? Just in case you haven't heard it, you can go back and listen to one of our previous episodes, uh, Pratchett 24, where Sven actually did send us in a pod card and he revealed that the early translations of Pratchett books were published by a very cheap children's publisher. And one of the ways they saved money was by putting adverts in the books. 
So they had like these ads for all kinds of foods in them, and some of them wow. had ads for Maggi noodles, like in the middle pages of the book. You'd like turn the page of the book, and there's an ad for Maggi noodles. That is amazing. They did not get to keep the license for too long once that <laughs> was revealed. I love it. But we kind of already answered the what dish from another book would we like to see in there. But what about, you know, would you, we, are there any that you wish you could see what the original Nanny Og version was like before it was round like world the defined? Ginger, the gingerbread men and women that we have seen nothing of because they were too <laughs> pornographic to yes. stay in the book. <laughs> I also want to know what are the missing ingredients from, from the ones that have had ingredients mm. taken out? Because, you know, they might not be things that actually exist in our world and I want to know what they True. are. True. Or it could just be like cocaine or something. Like it could be like a real... <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Maybe it's the ground up fairies. I feel like that's the Discworld equivalent of cocaine somehow. You snort them. But what about a favourite flower from the flower park? Because they have so many good ones. I think I my one, I, I thought about this. Um, I feel like Love Lies Panting is just <laughs> like they're all good, but I think that's my personal favourite. That is a great one. It's the least subtle, perhaps. <laughs> Although, well, I mean, Scarlet Bellweed, that's not particularly subtle either. Creeping shrill flower mm. is quite beautiful. Oh, yeah. Oh, I do also like maiden's puzzle. Toad spurge, a little Toad's bit upsetting. <laughs> I'd have liked to know a bit more about the peonies like the, in the note that says that it's too obscene to be included. So <laughs> I guess the name sort of offers something towards that, but oh. Toad spurge, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't really give us any more, but that's all right. Thank you, Sven. Sven's been with us a long time now, Carl, and always sends in like a really great zinger of a question that we can use as the last one. So thank you, Sven, for being with us for all these episodes, 50 episodes now. And then we kind of are at the end of this episode. So we should say thank you, Carl, so much for coming back. Oh, thank you for having me. And thank you for um, making me experience uh, <laughs> sticky toffee rat on a stick. That was, I mean... <laughs> Makes us sound like we chose that for you. you, yeah, you wow. Well, you feel like we should reimburse you for a plate that surely is just not usable again. Yeah. We, we'll sort that out. I'm Send just leaving it in to soak, actually. <laughs> 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 and and sadly, that is actually true. It's been sitting in the sink since last night. <laughs> oh, no. But while it's soaking, I mean, you, you are busy. You've got to run off to a gig in a moment. But you've been up to all kinds of things. When we f talked to you last, all those years ago, you were just about to publish your first book. Yes. So I've published two kids' books. Um, they're called George and the Great Bum Stampede and George and the Great Brain Swappery. Oh, great names. So they are out. And I'm about to put a podcast out. I've been saying this for months. I'm about to put a podcast out, which is called The Story Tailor, which is kids' stories that I've made up using words and names from kids. So... Oh. Hopefully, so good. if I keep saying it, it will actually happen. I've got the first few episodes ready to go, uh, but that's going to be up really soon. Oh, I can't wait for that. That sounds amazing. Uh, so watch out for that, Storyteller. Once it's out, we'll make sure we put a link up to that in our Great. show notes, and there'll be links where you can find out what Cal's up to. But thank you so much again for joining us. Oh, what a joy. What a pleasure. What, what, how nice to see other faces. That's not the faces at my house. <laughs> <laughs> it is still a, a remarkable joy every day. Yeah, It is. It is. And we also, of course, want to thank you. We've been doing this now for 50 episodes. Liz, 50. I can't believe it. Like, that's just, that's a huge milestone. Oh. Like, I'm, I'm so proud of us. I love that it's happening. It's just, it's, everything is great. I just, I'm not good at expressing emotion, but it is, I can't believe we made it to 50 and we've still got, like, so many to go and I'm so excited about it as well. Like, I have not, like, if anything, I've gotten more enthusiastic about the project the deeper in we've gotten to it. So it's just, it's very cool. And I particularly enjoy that we've started doing more of the other stuff, like we've been doing some of the short stories. We, we can't guarantee our schedule at the moment. We've had to make a few changes recently, but uh, we're looking at doing some of the adaptations of his books in the near future. So, yeah, I'm really excited about that. The only thing I'm worried about is that I don't want us to go over 100 episodes because then I have to change the naming scheme for the files for the podcast, and I'm a nerd about that. Um, but that's that's not really a worry that I have. Uh, but thank you. Uh, however long you've been listening, whether you've just come on board in the last few months or if you've been listening from the very start, there's no point in us doing this unless there are people listening. So this is this is really for you. I mean, we enjoy doing it. It's also for us, but having you listen, and for those of you who support the podcast by subscribing, thank you. You've made this really possible and sustainable, particularly over the last couple of years that have been so tough. So thank you. Thank you. We're looking forward to another however many episodes. We just don't know. 
we are going to have, as we said when we did our 30th episode, which amazingly was at the beginning of all of the nonsense we've gone through in the last couple of years. Uh, but we, we said we'd do another one of those kind of introspective episodes at Pratchat 60. So watch out for that in about 10 episodes time, which doesn't feel like a lot, but is also 10 months away. So mm. um, we will look forward to that. But also, um, we've got some exciting news from us, which is that we were nominated for an award, the Ditmar Award. It was very exciting. And thank you to whoever nominated us. It is a huge, like, it was a surprise, but it was also so lovely. Like, so thank you so much. Yeah. So if you don't know, the Ditmar Awards are kind of like the Australian version of the Hugo Awards. They're a fan community award. And we were nominated for Best Fan Publication in Any Medium. We didn't win. Uh, we'd like to congratulate the winners, the Cood Street Podcast. That's another podcast you can check out. There's sort of like a general discussion of sci-fi and fantasy stuff. Yeah, congratulations to them and all the other winners. There are a couple of people I knew or had heard of, uh, one of whom we'll mention in just a moment. But we do also have some some sad news. We were really looking forward to going to Sydney for the next Australian Discworld convention, which would have been held in April but unfortunately, the organisers have had to make the decision after delaying the convention for a full year to cancel it entirely. And we just want to say to Steve and all the other organisers who have put in so much work that this would have been a really difficult decision. But I, I want to say how much respect I have for you that you are putting people's health and safety as well as your own financial stability, because these things are not funded by anything except ticket sales I think you made the right choice, but I understand how difficult it must have been. So thank you. And we're excited that you're still doing an online event on the 11th of December for people who are members of the convention, which may still be available to get tickets to if you want to attend. That's happening just after this episode comes out. So if you're listening to this a week after it's come out, you've missed it. But uh, heart goes out to you. And yeah. I just want to say how important a part of the community you guys are. And my first convention that I went to, like, what was it 2019? 20, like, time has lost all meaning, but mm-hmm. it was just a kind of a breakthrough experience for me to be in a room with so many other Pratchett fans and experience just that level of enthusiasm. It wasn't anything that, because I haven't been to a lot of conventions and it was something I hadn't experienced before. And it just, it's hard to put into words, like, what that means. So I know it would have been a really tough, heartbreaking decision to do. It was the right one. But I just wanted to say, like, how much we appreciate everything you do. And we can't wait to see you all again in whatever format that will be in the future. Yeah. And I have every faith that the Australian Discworld Convention will be back in, in some way. I really believe the Discworld community will rally and we will see that convention come back when it is safe and viable to do so. We don't want to end on a bummer. We have got some exciting news of our own. Um, in fact, two bits. I was going to say, like, Nanny Og would love to end on no, but... Um... <laughs> <laughs> Rude. Uh, Liz, so going to edit that out, you? put in a pin and a note from the editor about not making their <laughs> wife laugh. Oh, no, that was it's too good. Staying in. But uh, we do have a little Hogswatch present for all of you. I say little. It's, it's kind of gone a bit out of control. Yes. But <laughs> we will be releasing a bonus episode for Hogswatch. It'll come out on Christmas Day in which we thought it'd be fun to have a bit of a, a Hogswatch feast of as many people as we could get cooking different things from Nanny Og's cookbook because we couldn't practically really make the time to cook lots of stuff. But we're so excited. We're going to have guests from other Pratchett podcasts. We're going to have some of our previous guests from the podcast. We're going to have one or two people who haven't been on the podcast before, but what we hope to have on in the future. It's going to be a bit of an extravaganza. And look, if you have any last minute questions, you kind of really want to ask us about Hogswatch, about the book, about doing the podcast, we might have room to slip a couple in. If you want to give us questions about that, you can tweet us or get in touch with us via email. Email is chat at pratchatpodcast.com. And if you're going to use a hashtag for it, use the hashtag HogsWatchFeast, because I'm pretty sure no one else has used that. And I just really like that. <laughs> so love it. that's going to be a lot of fun. And our next piece of news is, well, look, it's kind of the same news we do every month, mm. but it's about what are we going to read next? And look, we are leaping forward a little bit in the Discworld order. We're going forward to 2006 to read the next book in the Tiffany Aching series, which is Wintersmith. And we're going to be discussing it 
with our special guest. Liz, do you want to tell everyone who our special guest is? Author Garth Nix. Yes. Renowned fantasy sci-fi author Garth Nix, um, who did just win a Ditma for Best Novel for the Left-Handed Booksellers of London. So we're excited to talk to him. That's going to be a lot of fun. If you would like to send us questions about Wintersmith, you should send them in via social media uh, or via email, the aforementioned address. And the hashtag to use for that episode is Pratchat51, because we are now more than 50 episodes old. Oh, good Lord. Oh. Um, yeah. Wow. Okay. How many daughters in law do we have now? <laughs> Too many. No. Um, you think they could pull their weight around here and do a yeah. bit more of the podcast and work, but no, <laughs> I guess not. Anyway, thank you once again, listeners. Remember, if you if you enjoy the podcast and you want to help us make sure we get all the way to the end, because it feels like we're well past the halfway mark now, but who knows? We've, we're starting to do so much extra stuff. Please do just let people know. Tell your friends in person. Tweet about us. If you want to review and and rate us on various platforms, that is helpful. But really the most helpful thing is just telling other people who you think might enjoy the podcast. And of course, you can support us monetarily if you want to. You can find out all about that on our website. But until next time, remember that sometimes a rat on a stick is just a rat on a stick. You've been listening to Pratchat, the monthly Terry Pratchett book club podcast with Pratchatter's Elizabeth Flux. Ben McKenzie, that's me, and guest Cal Wilson. Pratchat is produced and edited by me with music by David Ashton of Sample and Hold Studios. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Pratchat Podcast and listen to past episodes and support the production of new ones via pratchatpodcast.com. Join the conversation for this episode using the hashtag Pratchat50. Pratchat is brought to you by Splendid Chaps Productions. We make entertainment for your ears, like the Doctor Who podcast Splendid Chaps and time travel comedy series Night Terrace. To find out more, visit SplendidChaps.com.